next, uh, I'll let him, I'll stop and let him uh, talk. But uh, my understanding is this is the first of a series of uh, telemedicine talks um, uh, that will be run by ALSF. Uh, they're Alex talks, I guess you could say. And Jay asked me to give one and I said I was happy to. So I'm gonna talk about uh, cancer predisposition and I'm going to um, start sharing my screen and then I'll give my introductory remarks. Let's see if I can minimize this up here. Okay. So I'm talking about cancer predisposition in children and the concept that this is an area that's growing in awareness of how important it is. I'd like to put it in brief context. And that is that we've come a long way in treating children with cancer and we're curing 80% and that's wonderful. Uh, the problem is we sort of plateaued and it's gonna be difficult to cure the last 20% or so. And also we're experiencing a lot of toxicity in those that we do cure, particularly those with high risk disease. So the more we look, the more we see, uh, but clearly we need, I would say more effective, less toxic therapy. There are a number of approaches to doing that. Uh, one is with targeted drugs, one is with uh, immunotherapy, whether it's CAR T cells or antibodies or vaccines or whatever. Uh, another way is with targeted drug delivery, which I won't talk about today, but I could talk about in the future. Uh, unfortunately, only a small fraction of the drugs we give actually get to the tumor, and I think we need to be smarter about how to get drug to the tumor. But another way to achieve sort of the same goal to have more effective, less toxic therapy is to pick up tumors early when they're small, more easily resectable, require less therapy, less likely to be metastatic, and have a better outcome. And so with less therapy, there'd be fewer side effects. So it's more effective, less toxic. And that is by identifying the increasing subset of children that we now appreciate uh, are, have predisposition to develop uh, cancer. Um, I don't have a slide on this, but I have no uh, conflicts of interest or anything to disclose regarding this. So there seems to be a bit of a delay in slide progression. There we go. So um, previously, at least when I was in training and for a long time after, we thought only a very small fraction of children were actually predisposed to get uh, cancer due to a germline uh, predisposition or germline change. Um, however, we now understand this number is, is much greater. There are more predisposition syndromes have been identified. Very importantly, the sequencing of tumor tissue has identified mutations and predisposition genes that were not anticipated. And as a caveat to that, I think more and more people are doing paired normal tumor DNA in order to interpret the changes in the tumor DNA as to whether they're uh, inherited or acquired, but it also gives us more insight into um, there being germline changes that may have been responsible for the cancer that the child has that we're dealing with. So there are several studies I'll show on the next slide that suggest at least 10 or 15% of children with cancer are predisposed and I think this is likely an underestimate because um, there are children who have a predisposition syndrome but don't have changes in the anticipated genes such as juvenile polyposis. Only a, a minority of children with juvenile polyposis syndrome have changes in SMAD4 or BMPR1A, which are the two genes that uh, Jim Howe first associated with this uh, syndrome. There also are inherited patterns in families like multiple members with Hodgkin disease or something where we don't even know a gene to look at. So there are genes to be discovered. Um, there also are likely lower penetrance genes that don't stand out uh, on a Manhattan plot or something, but may be contributing significantly uh, to predisposition. There's some genes that uh, some diseases may be multigenic, uh, certainly recessive is another possibility. 
Uh, so there may be combinations of genes of the same or different uh, type that uh, can predispose in aggregate. And finally, there are epigenetic changes, which we know about in terms of at least Beckwith Wiedemann, which we'll talk about briefly. So um, oh, I'm going to go to my laser pointer here. Yay. So here are uh, some of the recent studies that have been reported starting um, in 1915 to 1918. And if you look here, the prevalence uh, uh, and then the family history is shown below, but the prevalence of a predisposition gene in, in series that were sequenced by Modi, this very large one from St. Jude by Zhang and uh, uh, Will Parsons and Harris and, and Oberg and so forth. You can see they range from 9.9 .9 to 10, 12, up to 20%. And, and in general, 40 to 60% will have a family history, but clearly not all. In some cases, it wasn't uh, stated. So um, there are some caveats with this. If you look at the genes that have been identified, you can see that in most studies, TP53 or Lee-Fraumini syndrome uh, is the gene most commonly involved. And it is actually the most commonly involved gene in adult cancer for, in terms of somatic changes, but it's, it's, a, it's a very prominent player in pediatric cancer as well. There are other genes that stood out as the most common, such as APC, but TP53 is also there in this study, DICER1, but also TP53. If you look at this, the series of genes that were identified, you also see there are genes that we don't normally such as BRCA2. Uh, so it may be that there is a subset of patients, maybe with specific changes in BRCA1 that are predisposed to certain childhood cancers. And that's something we're still trying to sort out. So the, these, other genes may inflate the numbers a little bit, but based on what I said in the previous slide, uh, there's still a lot more to be discovered. So I think these numbers are reasonable estimates of what we may be ultimately um, looking at. So um, in, in this uh, slide, you see the services that are provided by uh, cancer predisposition programs. And there are a number of large ones around um, this country as well as in Canada and uh, throughout Europe and other places as, as well. But uh, if you look at the family histories that many pediatric residents and fellows and even pediatricians take, they're usually not very detailed. They talk about the parents and the siblings and they may or may not go to grandparents, but usually not much more beyond that. So it's good to take a very detailed family history and, and ask a lot of questions uh, and a good physical exam, but, but we do that. And then we uh, perform genetic testing plus both pre and post genetic counseling. So families know what the test is going to do and what its implications are. Uh, if someone's positive, we coordinate testing for other at-risk family members. So if a child is positive, we coordinate testing for the parents. If they're positive, we do the siblings. And, and whichever parent is positive, we try and do their siblings and, and the children of their siblings and the grandparents and so forth. We also recommend cancer surveillance based on the diagnosis and the risk according to international consensus guidelines. So um, a number of people were involved in a workshop held in, 19, in 2016, sorry, that, uh, sponsored by ACR to develop guidelines for um, many of the more common predisposition syndromes. And that the link to that is shown on the bottom, and I'll talk about that again in a second. We also provide referrals to subspecialties as needed for surveillance. So a lot of the surveillance is physical exam, blood tests, uh, imaging like ultrasound and MRIs. Um, and uh, in other cases, additional uh, imaging or, or, sorry, additional assessments are needed, such as those with GI cancer predisposition, um, they need to see the gastroenterologist. For those with thyroid cancer, they, they're better off being followed by thyroid disease experts in terms of evaluating nodules, whether, they not to be, whether or not they need to be biopsied, and also following the chemistries that go along with that. Or for 
retinoblastoma, going, seeing the ophthalmologist on a regular basis. So we uh, coordinate that. And then if t cancers are detected <coughs> by this screening, they're referred to the oncologist for further therapy. So what are the reasons to refer a patient to the cancer predisposition program? So if an individual does not have cancer, uh, you're pretty much stuck with two things. One is a family history of uh, a cancers that suggest a pattern or a syndrome. And the second is physical features of a predisposition. FALA spots, any hypertrophy, ops would be uh, FAP or juvenile polyposis. FALA spots can be several things, but most notably neurofibromatosis, any hypertrophies, with weedman macrocephaly, ADD is uh, P10 syndrome. If an individual has cancer, in addition to these features here, there are other features, such as if they have bilateral or multifocal primary cancers, or multiple primary cancers, more than one of a different type. So one has to be careful when you're talking about multifocal cancers to distinguish new primaries from metastases. In, in most cases, that's not too hard, like bilateral adrenal glands, but if you have disease in the chest and a, an adrenal primary for neuroblastoma, for example, it may be hard to tell, is that a lymph node or is that a, 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 another primary tumor in the uh, thoracic ganglia? Uh, earlier than expected age is not that specific, but it certainly goes along with predisposition, particularly if you see uh, an adult cancer, say a colon cancer in a child, or certain cancers like pheochromocytomas and so forth. There also are specific types of syndrome-associated cancers, which you'll see on the next table. Um, and then the tumor profiling, um, uh, as I mentioned before, can be suggestive of mutated genes, particularly if they're in addition doing the germline DNA as a comparison. So here is a table of the, um, some of the diseases, the cancers, that are strongly associated with the predisposition syndrome. It's not in everyone necessarily, but it's in a substantial number. So uh, for retinoblastoma, we know that 40% overall have a predisposition syndrome, and and so 40% of 100 and 30% of 100 will be bilateral. We know about a third of patients with rhabdoid tumors will have germline changes in SMARC-B1 or SMARC-A4 less commonly. Uh, the majority of patients with pleuropulmonary blastoma, 70% maybe, uh, will have um, a germline DICER1 change. Uh, most patients in childhood with adrenocortical carcinomas will either have Lefraumini or, or Beckwith. <clears throat> patients with pheochromocytomas, the vast majority, over 80%, will have one of several syndromes, either multiple endocrine neoplasia, type 2A or B, with RET mutations, NF1, Van Hippel Lindau, or the uh, pleuropulmonary blastoma, uh, uh, sorry, the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma syndrome. Uh, there are seven genes that cause that, and, and four or five of them are in the SDH family. Uh, Medullary thyroid cancer. Almost all patients with that, uh, according to our endocrinologist, will have uh, MEN 2A or 2B. And then for Lee-Fraumini syndrome, the majority that have choroid plexus carcinomas and, and anaplastic rhabdo, uh, a lot of them will have germline changes. And there are others as well. <coughs> so uh, this is a a bar graph of the types of patients we've seen over the past uh, uh, 12 or, or 15 years. And after we sort of got a slow start to our program and then got going. But you can see we do not see patients with NF1 and NF2. They're seen in a separate program. And patients with bone marrow failure are similarly seen in a bone marrow failure clinic. So Danconi's anemia, Black Van Diamond, nemogen breakage, uh, all those things. Uh, so these are the syndromes, and if you sort of draw a line here, these are the more common disorders we see. Um, uh, and you can see retinal blastoma, <coughs> sorry for us, <coughs> uh, is, is 
the most common in part because we've been a longstanding referral center for these patients with Will's Eye Institute and Anna Meadows is here and so forth. Beckwith Wiedemann also very high, and this is probably in part due to having uh, Jen Kalish here, who's an expert in this particular area. Lee Fraumini, we see a substantial number, familial adenomous polyposis and juvenile polyposis, the P10 syndrome, paraganglioma syndrome, multiple endocrineoplasia, Putziegers, the Noonan rasopathies, uh, this is Gorlin syndrome, and then Dicer 1. So those are our top 12, and that's excluding, as I said, the ones you'd see down here, because NF1 would be off the charts uh, uh, if that were included in this, in this particular chart. So when I, I mentioned this workshop we had, and this sort of summarizes, I'm not going to go into detail with, uh, with this, but this summarizes the 60 or so most common disorders and the related genes that we addressed in this, and we broke them into these categories here on the side. Um, so, and this was published in uh, 2017, along with all the other related papers on recommended surveillance protocols, and th these should all be uh, open access. So th this just distills that down to the more common things. The same group, so Leaf Ramini was its own subset, and, and there already had been criteria established by David Malkin and the Toronto group, and sometimes called the Toronto Protocol or Malkin Protocol, and that was slightly modified, but is uh, recommended here. The overgrowth syndromes, this was uh, uh, Jen Kalish and others dealing with, mainly beckwith Wiedemann, but other Wilms tumor predisposition syndromes like Wagger and Dennis Drash and Perlman syndrome, um, and as well as other overgrowth syndromes. Uh, we had the neurofibromatosis one and two group uh, and as a separate group, uh, the neural tumors, neuroblastoma, retino, medullo, and rhabdoid. We had the GI cancer predisposition syndromes, the neuroendocrine tumors, mainly the MENs, but also um, the uh, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma syndrome, leukemia predispositions, both ALL and AML, the DNA repair disorders, and then miscellaneous things like P10, Dicer 1, and the Noonan rhinosopathies. So there are recommended surveillance protocols. They're actually now being updated. Everything's a little bit uh, on hold because of the COVID uh, pandemic, but um, we expect to update those where necessary uh, in the coming uh, three to six months. So, um, I'm going to talk about three syndromes, and I could talk about you know ten or whatever, but I think it would it gets redundant. In most cases, the cancer predisposition syndromes are due to uh, an inactivating mutation of a gene, usually an autosome. So it's usually autosomal dominant, and it's the decreased or lack of function of the gene that causes the problem. Uh, there are examples of of uh, predisposition syndromes where a gene is actually activated. So certainly the rasopathies account for that and, and the hereditary neuroblastoma where there's activating mutations in the ALK gene, the ALK uh, receptor. Um, so I'm gonna talk about retinoblastoma. So this is sort of the first, the prototypic hereditary neoplasm. It's a single gene that leads to a single cancer, at least in general in the pediatric age group, they can get second malignancies. Um, and another single gene with multiple cancers, the Lee Fraumini syndrome and TP53. And then finally, I'll talk uh, briefly about Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome because this, unlike all the others where it's a DNA uh, alteration, whether it's a mutation or indel or deletion or frame shift or slicing change, they all lead to some dysfunctional uh, or truncated protein. In this case, the genes are fine, but the epigenetics that regulate the expression of the genes has changed. So in general, these are not inherited, whereas these obviously would be in an autosomal dominant 50-50 uh, uh, manner. So let's start with retinoblastoma. So um, I, this is probably well known to most of you, but it's just such a, a beautiful example of um, uh, predisposition syndrome because these patients has have such a high 
risk of getting retinoblastoma compared to the general population. So most tumors develop by age five and the presenting signs and symptoms are leukocoria, like you can see here, the cat's eye or uh, this white reflex. Um, frequently uh, these patients are identified because of pictures taken at a birthday or family event. And, but they can have esotropia because they can't see and the, the eye starts drifting. Uh, or they can have conjunctivitis because of some alterations in blood flow. This represents about 3% of all the cancers we see in children under 15. So the prevalence of this disease is one in 30,000 live births. So it's pretty uncommon. But if you, uh, and as I'll show you, it's, it's due to mutations in the RB1 gene. But if you have a mutation in the RB1 gene, your chance of getting it is not quite 100%, but it's very high. It's over 90%, 90, 95%. So that means instead of one in 30,000, it's like one. So that's 30,000 times more likely to get retinoblastoma. And the average child who gets retinoblastoma, uh, three-fourths of them have bilateral disease, but um, they will have uh, multiple tumors. So if you consider the average number of tumors is three, they have almost a 100,000-fold increased risk of getting cancer. There are about 300 cases per year. 60% are sporadic. These are by definition all but 40% are germline with a very high penetrance as well, and, and even unifocal. So it, it's still uh, necessary to do genetic testing. Um, so it, it's necessary to do genetic testing to be sure. Uh, the majority of the hereditary cases are bilateral. In some cases are trilateral, as, as it's referred to, if they have a, a, a pineal, uh, pinealoma or, or a tumor in the pineal gland. And this is just a pie chart showing that. So this is a figure taken from uh, an early report by Al Knudsen, and, and this will lead us to the Knudsen hypothesis. So he analyzed the age at diagnosis and how many were not yet diagnosed by that age, because um, he's a statistician and that's, this is how he thinks about things. And he plotted the individuals with unilateral disease, which are the circles, and the bilateral disease, which are the squares. And if he draws a curve of best fit, this, this correlated with a single hit event, or, uh, and this correlated with a two hit event. So he came up with the, the two hit hypothesis that um, with sporadic disease, you have to you have normal chromosome 13s, you acquire one hit, you get a second hit in a single cell, and that becomes a tumor. And with the hereditary form, you already have a mutation or inactivation of one copy of RB1. You get a second one, usually a deletion. And so this happens much more quickly and you have this very high chance of getting it. And in terms of pedigrees, it's autosomal dominant, although you can have uh, individuals, uh, obligate carriers that don't, didn't apparently have the disease, whereas sporadic disease, there should be no family history. So this is just a diagram of chromosome 13. So the gene was mapped, uh, RB1 was mapped to 13Q14.2. You can see there are the functional domains of the, of the protein shown here and where mutations have been reported. And, and this is just a subset of them. They're all over the place. So there are some hotspots that occur more commonly, but there's, there's not like everything occurs in this region or this region or something. They're, they're all over the place. So there have been several reports uh, looking for RB1 germline mutations in patients that either had bilateral disease or unilateral disease. And interestingly, uh, they use different techniques, uh, PCR and MLPA and DGGE and next-gen sequencing and Sanger sequencing and so forth. And they all uh, demonstrated at least 90% of patients with bilateral disease and you know, roughly 14, 15% of those with unilateral disease <coughs> would also test positive. The one test of these that were reported um, came from Arupa Ganguly uh, at Penn and doing next-gen sequencing. And she found 97% uh, of patients with uh, uh, 
as this would be 95 actually of 19 out of 20, but, but a, a, a much higher percentage, only one was missed. Um, and she uh, says from work she's done subsequently that, that most of the remaining patients, the other 5% or 3%, um, were likely a mosaic. Uh, so there still may be another gene that causes retinoblastoma, and we know that um, MICN amplification can cause it as a, a, uh, without involving the RB1 uh, genes in, as a sporadic change, but MICN amplification doesn't occur as a germline change. Uh, so anyway, as far as we know, in terms of germline predisposition, RB1 is the, the only gene that's involved in this. So uh, the surveillance is pretty much borrowed from this American Association of Ophthalmic Oncologists and Pathologists, the AUP group. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a, just a sequential reduction in the frequency of doing uh, intraocular or exams under anesthesia. So um, in the first eight weeks, they do exams every two to four weeks, but non-sedated. Then they start sedating them and they're done monthly for the first year, every two months for the next year, every three months and every four months and every six months. And <clears throat> although the recommendations are to stop after five, there are a few patients have been reported who are somewhat older. Some people continue till uh, six or seven or eight or so, but th this, this is the official recommendations. Um, in terms of um, looking for the pineoblastoma, uh, to look for this trilateral disease, uh, everyone pretty much recommends doing an MRI at the time of diagnosis. And some centers recommend doing an MRI every six months for five years. Most people think that's overkill. And frequent, they're usually present at the time of diagnosis if they're going to be. And particularly if they're getting chemotherapy, that can have an effect on the later development of a trilateral or a, a pineoblastoma. So as I mentioned before, there are a subset of um, patients who harbor a germline RB1 mutation are at risk for second malignancies. And this is estimated to be 15 to 20% over their lifetime. Uh, it's, it's much lower than this in the pediatric age group, like up to age 20. But the types of cancer they would get are sarcomas of bone and soft tissue, like osteosarcoma, the rhabdo or other soft tissue sarcomas, um, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, melanoma, and melanoma can also occur. Um, the risk uh, is uh, at least doubled or more if you get radiation therapy. So it's important to avoid that in their therapy if you can, if you know they have the hereditary form. But for older patients right now, the only recommended surveillance after the age of 10 actually is uh, skin exams looking for melanoma by age 18, and education of patients to, um, uh, to pay close attention to lumps and bumps, aches or pains that don't go away or can't be easily explained and get them investigated. There's some who consider whole body MRI annually after age eight, but there's no consensus on this and most people didn't think this was uh, warranted. So next I will talk about Lee-Fraumini syndrome. So um, this syndrome was described by Fred Lee and Joe Fraumini back in 1969. It was a hereditary cancer syndrome that largely was identified by patients like children with sarcomas and adults with breast cancer. Uh, but it's since been expanded quite a bit um, and Currently, the core cancers that are associated with Lee-Fraumini syndrome are brain tumors of various sorts, including choroid plexus carcinomas, but also glial tumors and medullose, uh, ALL, which is usually hypodiploid. Uh, there are sarcomas of bone and soft tissue like rhabdo and osteo and uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma. And in, in older patients, they're at higher risk for breast cancer, colon cancer, and potentially other cancers as well. In their lifetime, up to age 60, 90% of women and 80% of men will get at least one tumor by age 60. And on average, they will have three tumors. And I know one of the patients we follow is 19 and has had seven tumors, a couple of which have been presumptive second malignancies due to therapy. But 
system. There's no phenotypic feature of a patient with Lee Fraumini except cancer predisposition. So you can't do a physical exam and tell who has it and who doesn't. So in 1990, David Malkin, working in Boston, uh, identified uh, mutations in TP53 as the cause of Lee Fraumini syndrome. And, and so in David, sort of the international guru of, of Lee Fraumini and children and adolescents, although there are many other people, including maybe some on the call, who are also ex extremely expert and I'm sure much more so than, than I am. Um, but the mutations uh, that occur in the TP53 gene are, are quite variable, but there are certain hot spots. You can see certain places where they occur more often and um, there's a lot of interest to identify genotype-phenotype correlations um, to determine if there, a change in the gene here is different than a change in the gene here. Are they more likely or less likely to get certain cancers, to get them at an earlier age, or whatever? The, the, the only one of these we can say for, with relative certainty is this R337H, or the Brazilian mutation that occurs in codon 37 of the TB53 gene, uh, most, not all, but almost all uh, patients with uh, R337H have some Brazilian ancestry. Um, and uh, they seem to have a somewhat more attenuated uh, pattern for developing cancer, particularly in adults, but they're at increased risk for choroid plexus carcinomas and adrenal cortical carcinomas. Um, so we'd like to explore genotype phenotype uh, in other diseases, as I'll mention at the end. So the initial Lee Fraumini diagnostic criteria were a proband who had a sarcoma by age 45, a first degree relative with any cancer under 45, or a first or second degree relative with any cancer under 45, uh, or a sarcoma at any age. So th these were a little bit vague and they've been modified by a variety of people, including Champre and Gonzalez, and the more most recent I could find was the, the Bulgard um, 2015 uh, version of this, which is summarized here. And this is in a JCO publication if you want to read it in detail. But they, uh, this is their version of the Champre criteria. I won't read all this, but there's, it's based on the, the um, family history, multiple, um, uh, says primitive, I think they may mean primary tumors, and rare tumors or early onset. I should say this says they have leaf from any center for therapy. Um, so as I mentioned, children under age 20 are mainly at risk for five things, uh, uh, rhabdo, osteo, ALL, and um, brain tumors and adrenocortical carcinoma. Um, and rhabdo, particularly if they have diffuse anaplasia and ALLs if they're hypodiploid, and then uh, any choroid plexus carcinoma, they're very likely to have a germline change. And the current recommended surveillance is to do the whole body MRI every year and a brain MRI as well. So the brain MRI is included in the whole body, but the neuroradiologists generally think it's suboptimal to detect subtle brain lesions. So that right now they're both recommended. And if the whole body MRI gets better in terms of resolution, maybe that can just be done. We also recommend abdominal ultrasound in between. So every three to four months up to age 18. And we used to recommend lab work uh, to look for the adrenocortical carcinomas and uh, that's no longer recommended. So, um, and this is published in the paper by Kratz et al. in this uh, AACR series of um, articles. So I'll show you two examples of um, the results of surveillance testing that was done in, for Lee Fraumini patients uh, following the Toronto or Malkin protocol, but um, these, this was not a randomized trial. So were people that uh, underwent surveillance and those that refused to undergo surveillance. So in this particular first report in JAMA Oncology in 2011, <coughs> it was really 
striking, 100% versus 20%. Um, so all these patients were live, even, even who developed a malignancy during the time they were being followed, either with or without surveillance. So this was very striking. They did a, a longer follow-up with more patients, and the results were still, it was, you know, almost 90% versus 60% or so. It was still a, a significant difference, as you can see. And there were a lot more patients in here, but not many out here at the tail. And if you look at how the tumors were identified in these patients, that's shown here. And we'll just focus on the malignant subset because there are, with this type of surveillance, you pick up incidental things that are either pre-malignant or not malignant at all and even incidental findings. But of the malignant ones, you know, 25% or so were picked up by the whole body MRI, so that's pretty good. And then it's up to 45% or so, almost 50% if you include the brain MRI. So clearly the MRIs picked up almost half the cases. But clinical exam in some cases, colonoscopy, for, uh, uh, as well as abdom the abdominal ultrasound actually picked up some. Uh, blood work when they did it, and then uh, this was mammography. So those were the tests that really seemed to work. And obviously the, the mammography um, was really for patients that were older than our usual age group. But that, so the, anyway, the point is, we'd rather pick up a grape than a grapefruit. If you can pick up a small tumor in the kidney or the liver or the muscle or the bone, uh, you have a much greater chance of being able to resect it you are likely to uh, eliminate the need for radiation therapy. The amount of chemotherapy is likely to be less. They're less likely to be metastatic. Better cure rate, fewer side effects, win-win. So, so that's how surveillance, regardless of the disorder, doing surveillance and picking up tumors early uh, can achieve a, a tremendous uh, advantage in terms of, of this mantra of more effective, less toxic toxic therapy, because less therapy is needed. So finally, I'll talk about Beckwith-Wiedemann briefly, and then we can have questions if there uh, are any. So obviously, this was described by Beckwith and Wiedemann, um, and it's now considered sort of a spectrum, because the full-blown Beckwith-Wiedemann with you know, 9 to 12 pounds at birth and big mouth, big body, big liver, big spleen, the abdomen doesn't close, they have pancreatic eyelid hypertrophy and hypoglycemia and macroglossia and they can't close their mouth, they have trouble breathing, et cetera. So that's sort of the full-blown Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, but we now know this spectrum can include everything from just a big hand or foot or tongue or big right arm and big left leg or whatever. So, um, and, and the uh, testing for this is different than the traditional DNA sequencing that we do. So the cancers to which these patients are most predisposed are Wilms tumor and hepatoblastoma. And the hepatoblastoma risk is really in the first three to four years of life. So we screen up to age four and then Wilms tumor up to age seven or, or eight. And this just shows uh, a macroglossia, the ear, crits, ear creases and sometimes pits you see. Um, this shows the macroglossia, the umbilical hernia because the abdomen couldn't close leg length discrepancy if one leg's involved and the other isn't, and this is a variation of that where it's more girth than length. Uh, it can be either or both. So th this sort of summarizes the type of epigenetic changes that occur in patients with Beckwith-Wiedemann, and typically uh, most people have a, um, a paternal pattern of methylation and a maternal pattern of methylation, and, and the the paternal pattern favors growth and the maternal pattern suppresses growth. So what happens in Beckwith-Wiedemann is you have, you have more of this and less of this, more of the paternal and less of the paternal. So if there's hypomethylation at the maternal locus here, that accounts for half of them. So they have the paternal pattern. And similarly, you can have hypermethylation of the, of the uh, maternal IC1 and you can have this pattern with IGF-2 driving the growth. So these two are, uh, don't, are, aren't as prone to causing cancer because it's either one or the other. But with uniparental isodisomy, you actually have two copies of the dad's DNA as well as his imprinting pattern. So the entire locus is involved. And these patients have the highest risk of developing uh, cancer. Uh, 
Um, and this is the percentage, not the risk of cancer. The risk of cancer is about five to 10% overall. It's about 20 or 25% in the isodicomy patients. Interestingly, you can have inactivating mutations of CDKN1C, and, and that's a fairly uncommon genetic cause of Beckwith-Wiedemann, but this is the type that could be heritable, and it accounts for maybe at least half the cases that are, are inherited. Um, so it, as a caveat, I saw one family where a child was born who had a big left arm and a big right leg, and she had the um, I, IC2 pattern of methylation. And then she had a sibling born two years later who had a big left arm and a big right leg. She had exactly the same pattern in the child, even though there, it wasn't caused by a germline change, at least that we could identify. So anyway, strange things happen. <coughs> Sorry. So here's the surveillance protocol for um, the beckwith wiedemann hemi hypertrophy. And we apply this protocol to other uh, disorders where there's increased risk for Wilms tumor and or hepatoblastoma. So the overall risk I said is, um, is 5% highest in hysodicomy, lowest in IC2 uh, methylation. We do an abdominal ultrasound, full abdominal, every three months starting at birth or at diagnosis until age four. And then we also do AFP testing, again, to look for uh, hepatoblastoma starting at birth or at diagnosis and until age four. And then these stop, but the ultrasound continues as a renal adrenal ultrasound from age four to seven every three months. And then we stop. And again, some people go on to eight. I just had a telemedicine uh, visit with a patient today, this morning, that is going to go on till eight in part because the, another doctor as well as the parents want to continue. So that's fine. Um, Patients with CDKN1C, and this is kind of soft, but it, it, there, it, it does appear that some patients with CDKN1C mutations may also be at increased risk for neuroblastoma. So getting urinary catecholamines at these every three month visits would be worth doing. But there are no other good genotype, phenotype uh, modifications at this point. And as far as we know, there's no risk of cancer at older uh, ages in these patients. It's just the childhood cancers up until age seven or eight. I do know there's a Beckwith-Wiedemann patient we followed who stopped at age seven and developed Wilms tumor at age nine. So it does occur, but it's a pretty rare thing to happen. So this is the final slide, I guess, uh, to talk about future direction. So there's still, there's a lot to be done in this field. And I'd recommend any junior investigators looking for things to potentially get into, this would be an important one to consider. So new gene discovery. As I mentioned, there are patients that fit a pattern like a syndrome, like they have, they have juvenile polyps. And juvenile doesn't mean it occurred in a juvenile. It means a particular type of, of hamartomatous polyp as opposed to adenomatous polyp. Um, and the patients that have that and look like they have the syndrome and it's even familial, if they do not have changes in SMAD4 or BMPR1A, the two genes that have been associated with this disease. And, and there are other examples. Not everyone with what looks like Lee Framini family history will have a change in TP53. The vast majority do, 80, 90%, but not all. And, uh, and the same thing could be said for many of the other syndromes that we deal with. So, and there are also syndromes for which we don't have a gene to look at. Like I said, hereditary Hodgkin disease. I've seen at least three families with hereditary Hodgkin's and we, and we don't have a, a gene to look at uh, except for potentially uh, STAT1. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be done here. There also are the lower penetrance genes that we haven't focused on so much because of these uh, high penetrance genes where it's you know, a thousand fold, a hundred, ten thousand fold, a hundred thousand fold, but there are likely some that are 10, 50 to a hundred fold increased risk uh, where there are a lot of more genes to be identified. Um, whoops, sorry, wrong way. The next is genotype phenotype correlation. So there are some examples of this, but I think because of the um, the meeting we had in, in uh, 2016 and the publications in 17 with people doing this 
more consistently with more people doing testing of tumors and now testing of the germline, we're going to have a much larger, data, larger database to look at things like does a mutation in this area uh, differ from a, a mutation in this area or is a missense different than a nonsense or um, in a particular domain does it make a difference? <coughs> a DNA binding domain, a dimerization domain, a, a kinase domain, and so forth. So I think we'll be looking for uh, ways that we can personalize the risk the, and the recommendations for surveillance uh, based on that sort of information. Third, a lot of us are interested in novel surveillance tests. Um, uh, there are likely, in addition to things like serum AFP or urinary catecholamines or things like that. There are probably other markers that we could identify in the blood or urine um, that might be useful for picking up tumors early when we see a pattern of something increasing. Um, you know, it may, not, it may not be a protein, it could be a carbohydrate or a lipid or something else, but there likely are other tumor markers to be found. A lot of people are looking at cir circulating tumor material, I would say. So people are looking at tumor cells, at DNA, at RNA, at exosomes, uh, to try and identify that. And some have developed very sophisticated uh, microfluidic uh, ways to uh, capture the DNA from, from the tumor DNA from normal or tumor material and, and to analyze it. And also changes in the microbiome. <clears throat> the microbiome in the gut clearly plays some role in development of colon cancer. The microbiome in the mouth plays a different uh, a role in the development of oral cancers. Um, so, and the changes in the microbiome in the gut or potentially elsewhere also influence our immune system and can affect the immune response to, uh, to malignancy and can affect uh, malignancies at other sites, not just in the gut. Um, <clears throat> a fourth thing is prevention strategies in high-risk groups. So uh, people are starting to evaluate drugs uh, such as, let's say, um, mTOR inhibitors in patients with uh, activated uh, the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway in P10 syndrome or drugs that block MEK or, or MAP kinase in, in the RASopathies and and so forth. Um, there are some uh, other drugs that more directly influence the levels of P10 and can increase the levels of P10. So instead of decreasing, getting rid of something or blocking something, you can actually increase the protein half-life of P10 with certain uh, drugs, uh, indole 3 carbonyl. There may be dietary things we can do in microbiome transplants. If you have bacteria in your gut, that we know increase the likelihood of developing polyps and cancer. And we can give you a, a gut purge and, and reinstitute favorable uh, um, bacterial flora <coughs> or probiotics that are, are favorable. You may be able to delay or you know, reduce delay or whatever, maybe even prevent the development of some colon cancers. So that's something we'd like to be able to do. So there are a lot of things related to drugs and diet and lifestyle and microbiomes of your gut and your mouth and other places, maybe skin that uh, could be useful in, in trying to prevent cancer in high-risk individuals. And if these can be shown to work, then potentially, depending upon how expensive or toxic or whatever, they could be applied more broadly. Um, and Finally, we are in our program engaging the psychologist to study issues around the impact of the genetic diagnosis and testing, the ethics of decision making about whether to get tested, whether to uh, follow a surveillance protocol and so forth. Uh, and also disclosing adult cancer risk to children, like when is it the best time? Do you wait till they're 18 or do you do it while you have them? And, and so forth. So there are a lot of things that could be addressed there. And I'm sure there are more. These are just uh, a, a subset that uh, are obvious to many people. But anyway, I think there's a lot of exciting thing to be done in, in this overall field. I encourage some of the junior people who aren't wedded to something or are working in something that their mentor is working on and they, 
don't see an obvious path forward that's independent to consider working in this area. So that's it. I'm happy to ask any questions. I hope most of you are still awake and I will stop screen sharing if I can get this. There we go. So, Jen, are there any questions? You do have one question in the chat. Um, how good is compliance for predisposition surveillance? What are factors that impact compliance? So that's an excellent question. And I'm not just saying that, uh, it, <laughs> it is. Uh, and that's something else that our psychologist team, somebody we're just recruiting now is very interested in. So, because um, I think compliance is critical. It's critical with cancer therapy, it's critical with diabetes management, it's critical with, with everything. And in this area, if they aren't complying regularly, um, we, um, we're not gonna pick things up early and they're gonna end up presenting with clinical symptoms. So, <clears throat> so we need to work on compliance and what the barriers are. We, we know that some of it is insurance and cost. Some of it is the difficulty of busy parents to do something every three months or every six months even. Uh, if they're both working and it's hard to get the kids in and they're in school and it's hard to find the, the best time to do some of these things. Um, but we don't really have a good idea, particularly in this area, what affects compliance. So, so it's something we will be studying. Uh, there are a lot of things we can think of might contribute to uh, compliance. You know, people, you know, the kids don't want to get stuck and the parents don't want to take them or they don't want to put them to sleep because there may be some risk of that. Or it's uh, costly because they have to pay a deductible every time or their insurance won't cover it or um, they're just too busy or whatever. So or it's hard to get here and to get an exam. There are a lot of things that, but we don't know what are the real major causes. So it's very important to figure that out if we can. A couple more questions have come in, Garrett. Um, one is, have you looked at any predisposition disorders involving Burkitt-related cancers in children? So um, it, we, we're not seeing those uh, uh, patients very much. There are ones that, that predispose to leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, and and uh, in general, they're ALLs or AMLs, a lot of AMLs. <coughs> we have a team that includes Suzanne McFarland, who is uh, very much focused on the GI cancer predisposition syndromes, and our division chief, Steve Hunger, who uh, ran the predisposition program in Denver before he came to CHOP. And actually, Steve sees most of those, although a lot of them come through us, and then he's just ends up being the physician that partners with one of our genetic counselors to see them. So um, uh, off, offhand, I, I can't think of any, but Steve would be the one who, who saw them. So um, I, I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't. Another, another question came in. Is there any evidence of variation in genotype phenotype correlations in predisposition syndromes across different race and ethnic groups? So another excellent question. And, um, uh, and I, one that I'm, I do not think has been addressed. I think people are um, initially focused on just determining if there are any at all in the general population. And I think once, if you establish that there are some, then you could look. But I think um, it's a very good point because maybe if you look at the population as a whole, you won't see any obvious genotype phenotype correlation. But if you look in African American or Hispanic or Asian or uh, other uh, ethnic subgroups, you you might see something in, that, in them. So I, I think it's an excellent point that that uh, needs to be look at, looked at um, uh, pr prospectively in, in parallel, not after we figure out the genotype phenotype. Because I think we could pick something up looking at those uh, ethnic subgroups that we might miss if we just look at the general population. 
Thank you, Garrett. A couple more questions have come in. By the way, I want to thank you for doing this uh, talk today. I had trouble getting on at the beginning, but we really appreciate it. You've been a friend to Alex's Lemonade for a long time, a friend to Liz and I for a long time, and we appreciate you giving us the time and talent today. It's been my pleasure. Okay, next question is for patients with germline mutations that are associated with childhood cancers, but that do not have a well-established surveillance guidelines. How do you decide on a surveillance plan? Oh, so another very good question. So um, <clears throat> I've been interested in predisposition for a long time. Like when I was um, an intern and resident in St. Louis, I was following a family that had two children with neuroblastoma. One died and one uh, is still alive with multiple ganglion aromas. Their father developed neuroblastoma at age 44 and had metastatic disease and died. Uh, and that person and that family ended up having an ALK mutation. We now know, but I had no idea then. So I've been interested in a long time. Uh, I, I hired Kim Nichols in 99 to establish a cancer predisposition program at CHOP and she did and then she was recruited to St. Jude to set up one there and so I took over and it became evident to me that there, there weren't a lot of uh, well accepted or agreed upon surveillance protocols for many diseases. I think um, Leif Ramini, Beckwith Wiedemann, maybe retinoblastoma, neurofibromatosis, there, there were some where some group or another that dealt with these patients had come up with some recommendation. But for many, there, there weren't. Like if you say um, ASXL1 or NKX2-1 or, or fumarate hydratase deficiency or things like that in the uh, uh, hereditary lyo, uh, myoma and hereditary renal cancer and, and renal carcinoma syndrome. Uh, so what we did was identify the 60 or so most common uh, syndromes. And this was a team effort with David Malkin, Sharon Plon, Josh uh, Schiffman, and, and Kim Nichols. And we um, divided these into those groups that I showed, the nine groups. And we asked people to come to that meeting with recommendations, because in many cases, there weren't any. But if you say, if, there, if there's an in increased risk in patients with uh, uh, you know, a particular syndrome like uh, Edwards 18Q uh, trisomy, um, and they're at increased risk for Wilms tumor. Well, those are Wilms tumor protocol uh, that is established for back with Wiedemann, so we just follow that unless there's a good reason not to. It turns out in that, or to do anything different, it turns out in that population, they may actually get renal cancer for a longer period of time. So maybe surveillance would need to be extended, but again, it's a a, a very serious syndrome and many don't survive beyond the first year of life and maybe worrying about a low risk of cancer is not worthwhile. But we, we try and, and use a, a uh, protocol, if it seems applicable, that's been developed for another syndrome but has a, a similar uh, disease. So let me give you another example. For familial adenomas polyposis, only about 1% of patients with FAP will get hepatoblastoma. But 10% of patients with hepatoblastoma may have a germline change in uh, FAP. So, so we use the, again, the Beckwith-Wiedemann uh, syndrome uh, protocol for AFP and, and abdominal ultrasound every three months for four years. So we use that for that population of patients. So we, we sort of borrow where we can from one and um, uh, and, and use that unless there's a reason to do something differently. Either do it, start sooner, do it longer, do it more often, less often. Um, if, if something is just completely out of the blue, we sort of uh, come up with what would be the least invasive, most informative surveillance test we could do and factoring in not just the ability to detect things, but also um, the ability to, um, uh, to minimize any uh, discomfort to the patient and, and, and cost and so forth. So we try and factor all that in in, in developing a, uh, a protocol. So uh, I'm sure we'll be, we'll be expanding the protocols that exist for additional syndromes that aren't part of the, the top 60 that are included in the ACR um, reports. But um, I, I think it's, it's best 
to do it if we can get some consensus or agreement around that. So whether you're in uh, France or Germany or England or Spain or, or uh, whatever, or if you're in anywhere in the United States or Canada or Japan or Australia or China, that people will do the same thing. So we try and get some consensus if we have uh, new syndromes and we likely will have another ACR meeting maybe next year. I mean, that may be on hold now because of COVID, but, but we, we, we plan to have an additional workshop to catch up with what is being done, evaluate it, see if it needs to be changed, see if there are any new things that need to be added, and that would be a way to get them into the, the pipeline. Okay, Garrett, uh, thank you so much. One last question. Um, how common is it, is it to see a patient showing some signs of a cancer predisposition syndrome but never actually develops a type of cancer? Well, that's, um, it, it, it varies a lot by syndrome. So things like retinoblastoma, 95%. Uh, Lee Framini, uh, 90% will develop a cancer. <clears throat> but there are patients even with both those diseases that never develop a cancer. There are other, uh, there are other syndromes where they, they absolutely don't always develop a, uh, a malignancy. Um, so there are more attenuated forms of, uh, uh, of juvenile polyposis, where like half the patients will develop colon cancer, many will develop polyps, but not everyone uh, does or develop enough polyps to be called juvenile polyposis, or not everyone with DICER-1 germline change will develop cancer. We have seen patients with P10 syndrome, where the parents have P10 and were not diagnosed. Uh, and they don't have a cancer, and they're already in their 30s or 40s or whatever. So uh, it, it certainly does occur. So the absence of a cancer doesn't rule out that they have the gene. You have to do the, the, the testing. And, and the, the, there's penetrance and expressivity. The penetrance is do they get something, yes or no? And expressivity is they got it, how bad is it? Or what are the manifestations of it? Uh, so, uh, so penetrance is not 100% in... in uh, these disorders, so they clearly are people that don't don't develop any cancer, even in their lifetime. All right, uh, that was the last question. Person, uh, someone just said thank you for all the great information for the amazing work you're doing. But Garrett, again, appreciate your time today. Uh, appreciate everyone tuning in. Appreciate Jen who put this talk together and. Um, this is going to be the first in a series, so look for more. We're doing at least one a week, I think, for the next five weeks. We may try to squeeze more in. But um, thank you, Garrett. Okay, my Appreciate pleasure. It. Thank you all for tuning in. And I'll sign off. <laughs> bye, Jay. Bye, uh, Jen. And thanks for all your help in helping to get this started. Bye, Garrett. Thank you, Garrett. Bye.